from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me down there? Yes? Okay. I'm Mary Jane Deep, Chief of the African and Middle Eastern Division, and welcome to the Library of Congress. I'm delighted to see you all here on this very special occasion. Today, we are launching a brand new program entitled Conversations with African Writers and Poets. We are three partners uh, in this endeavor. The African section of the African Middle Eastern Division, the Poetry and Literature Center here at the library, headed by Robert Casper, and the Africa Society of the National Summit on Africa, whose president and CEO is Bernadette Paolo, who actually made this program possible. And I want to thank her very, very much. In a moment, you will hear more from both of them. Suffice is it to say that the three partners have decided to host a series of conversations with established African authors and poets, as well as with young and upcoming literary figures, whose interviews we will tape and make available on our website for everyone to see and to use. The aim is to record for posterity the voices and thoughts of African writers so that they may remain with us for generations to come and also that they may become accessible today, not only to everyone in the United States, but also to people around the world. And to put this new program into its cultural and historical framework, we have invited Professor Ali Mazrui, one of the most revered scholars on Africa, to share his thoughts with us. The interview will be conducted by Dr. Angel Batiste, the Area Specialist for West Africa, who is a scholar on Africa in her own right. The next program, uh, which we are planning soon, will take place on November 16th at 6 o'clock in the evening, when we will have Dr. Susan Kiguli, a poet, a writer, and a professor at Makarere University in Uganda. And of course, you're all invited. I want to thank Karen Jenkins, who's here, right there. She's the executive director of the African Studies Association, who has brought two presidential fellows to the library. And that's the first time we've done that. So two presidential fellows from Africa, one of whom is Susan Kiguli. So we will be ce celebrating her in our program on November 16th. Before I turn over the microphone to Robert Casper, the head of the Poetry and Literature Center, I would like to add that um, that's, you know, um, administrative point. I would like to add that the interview will last for an hour. This will be followed by a 15 minute Q&A and after which we will whisk Professor Mazrui away as he has other engagements. Okay, so enjoy. And now Robert Casper. Thank you. Uh, hi, thank you all. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I just want to say that uh, in my six months of uh, uh, heading the Poetry and Literature Center, I've had the opportunity to meet with and uh, work with a, a number of divisions within the library but uh, few are as dynamic and as exciting as the African and Middle Eastern Division, and a special thanks to Mary Jane Deeb for making this series possible, <clears throat> and uh, thanks to Angel Batiste for uh, uh, taking this on and, and uh, heading this first program and, and, and doing the interview. Uh, we're really thrilled to uh, be supporting the division and to be supporting world literature uh, not just focusing, as, as it's easy enough to do, on uh, the literature of uh, the United States. Um, and 
complementing the programs that we do most famously with the Poet Laureate of the United States uh, with programs that feature writers and uh, um, scholars from across the world. So thanks so much for coming, and I hope you come to more of our programs here in the African and Middle Eastern Division and uh, throughout the library. And uh, with that, I'd like to introduce Bernadette Paolo. Thank you, Robert. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests all. Thank you to Dr. Mary Jane Deeb and Dr. Angel Batiste and Dr. Robert Casper for everything you have done to make our collective vision a reality. I'd also like to thank our staff, Patricia Bain, Mariam Ba, and Sarah Caruso, who are from Uganda, Senegal, and Kenya, and represent the African youth here today. Today marks the beginning of a global campaign to highlight the academic achievements and literary contributions of African writers and poets. Their collective impact has been profound and has permeated the consciousness of scholars and students as it has depicted the realities, cultures, and aspirations of the continent's diverse citizenries. The Africa Society of the National Summit on Africa is very pleased to partner with the African section of the African and Middle Eastern Division and the Poetry and Literature Center of the Library of Congress for we believe very strongly in Africa's promise and potential and in showcasing the continent's many contributions to the world. Our mission is to engage and educate Americans together with our partners about the diverse cultures histories, and economies of the countries comprising the continent of Africa. It gives everyone associated with the Africa Society great honor to have as the first speaker in this series a named icon of the 20th century, one of Kenya's and Africa's most acclaimed sons, and a member of our board of directors, Professor Ali Mazrui. While introducing the professor is a daunting task with a 13-page biography and 187,000 mentions on Google, there is no danger of overstatement, which is a consolation. For today, we have a genius in our midst, an eminent scholar, a prolific writer, a world-renowned filmmaker whose achievements and accolades would take longer than the time we have allocated for this interview in its entirety. Deemed one of the top 100 intellectuals in the world by foreign policy and prospect magazines, Dr. Mazrui is heralded as being one of the key African literary, literary figures and scholars of all times. Born in Kenya, Mazuri earned a bachelor's degree from the University of Manchester in England a master's degree from Columbia University in New York, and a doctorate from Oxford University in England. He spent 10 years at Makerere University in Kampala, Uganda, where he served as head of the political science department, dean of the faculty of social sciences, as well as the dean of the law faculty. He served as professor of political science at the University of Michigan, where he directed the Center for Afro-American and African Studies. He is now Albert Schweitzer, Professor in the Humanities and Director of the Institute of Global Cultural Studies at Binghamton University, State University of New York. He is also Albert Lethuli, Professor at Large at the University of Jos in Nigeria. He is Andrew D. White, Professor at Large Emeritus and Senior Scholar in Africana Studies at Cornell University. He has no spare time, as you can see. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Mazrui has been appointed Chancellor of the Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology in Kenya, an appointment made by Kenya's head of state. He has been visiting scholar at Stanford, Chicago, Colgate, Singapore, Harvard, Australia, Oxford, Ohio State, Baghdad. He has lectured on five continents. He has served as special advisor to the World Bank and on the board of directors of the American Muslim Council. He has published more than 30 books and published hundreds of articles. And I might add, you will see when you look up Dr. Mazuri, that more articles of, have been written about him than those he has written. 
His research interests include African politics, international political culture, political Islam, and North-South relations. Uh, for those of you who are old enough to remember, Dr. Mazrui is best known for his 1986 PBS BBC documentary series, The Africans, A Triple Heritage. Like all great men, I can tell you that the professor's humility and gentility are among his greatest assets. And as they say, behind every great man is a great woman. He is accompanied today by his wife, Pauline, who we are glad could be with us. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Madhuri, who will discuss post-independence African literature. For most of us, Dr. Missouri is generally recognized as the Pan-African scholar and the political writer. Today, we acknowledge, today we acknowledge Dr. Missouri's literary scholarship. Dr. Missouri himself has written one work of African fiction, The Trial of Christopher Okobo. In addition to his written work, Dr. Missouri is perhaps best known for his major work, the television documentary series, The Africans, A Triple Heritage, which refers to the three main cultural influences <coughs> impacting Africa, traditional African culture, Islamic culture, and Western culture. Again, we acknowledge your literary scholarship. Professor Missouri, in 1986, you published an article in the UNESCO General History of Africa on the state of modern African literature in the period since 1935. At that time, you noted that the basic forms of creative literature in this period of African history were poetry and rhetoric, drama, theater, and the novel. Can you provide a short summary of post-independence African literature and also define the African literary canon in modern day African literature? Thank you very much. First of all, <coughs> is the microphone too loud? Mm -hmm. uh, let me thank the library very much indeed for this initiative, not just in relation to my participation, but to the concept itself and the intention to record the ideas and views and interpretations of African writers and making them available in the library's archives. Uh, I think this is a very important initiative uh, and uh, I look forward to listening to other writers uh, in the coming months and years, God willing. I must also apologize for my nasal voice today. I'm just recovering from a cold. I'm glad that uh, I wasn't coming here at the worst time of the cold. Now I'm a little better than before. So I hope in spite of the nasal nature of the voice, uh, you can identify the different words I utter intelligibly. Uh, and now back to business. Uh, well, uh, it is true I wrote uh, uh, an article about the development of African literature as part of that massive UNESCO project of the history of the continent in eight volumes. Uh, and I was privileged to be called upon to edit the eighth volume, the final volume of Africa since 1935, uh, and be a co-author uh, by providing additional chapters to the volume myself. I'm delighted that uh, that particular chapter is one of the more influential chapters I have written. Uh, many people have written to me in relation to what I said there. Uh, and it seems to have triggered some interest on the part of the library. Uh, and that's important. So uh, uh, 
but you want me to update it as it were. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I will try. Uh, because first of all, there have been further developments uh, since then. Uh, there have been changes. Uh, African writers are becoming more confident in experimentation. Uh, uh, they used to stick to whatever were the conventions uh, of the inherited uh, categories of literature uh, that they were writing in. Uh, they responded and uh, complied uh, with the literary canon as it was enunciated uh, by the Western world. So what has been happening since then is a, a greater readiness to uh, experiment with other things, what uh, Anthony Appiah has called uh, post-realism, post-realism, so that uh, the novel doesn't have to be a more closely constructed in terms of believable lifestyle, but you can take uh, risks and rely on uh, the suspension of disbelief, L uh, like a situation where uh, you have some natural, supernatural events happening in the novel, uh, which at the beginning of uh, African writers in the European languages, they avoided because it was risky. And now I think they are taking liberties in what is called post-realism uh, to venture forth. Uh, and this is, uh, of course, is, is being followed independently of Africa uh, in Western literature. That's what Harry Potter is all about, the spectacular success of Harry Potter writings and as well as the uh, movies is part of this fascination with uh, ma magic and wonder and what is supernatural. Uh, so African writers haven't gone quite as far as flying carpets, <laughs> but they're moving in that direction. Uh, and I'm mentioning it because it's a, it's a, a sign of uh, greater self-confidence uh, and a greater readiness to exp experiment. Uh, uh, I was uh, disappointed when I launched a project that African writers in indigenous languages did not get enough recognition. Uh, I, as some of you may be aware that as the last century was coming to an end, I was addressing a meeting of primarily publishers of books from different countries, but they were assembling in Harare uh, in Zimbabwe. Uh, and in my lecture, as the century was coming to an end, I said we should identify uh, the 100 best books mm -hmm. of the last 100 years from Africa uh, and then recognize publicly those 100 best books. Uh, I give uh, suggestions in my speeches uh, all over the world, so I wasn't very confident anybody would take care of it and find it an interesting idea and then walk home. But these publishers suddenly decided, Eureka, what an excellent <laughs> idea. <laughs> and, and it took off, it really took off. They established the machinery for uh, uh, evaluating uh, novels and then uh, identifying them in terms of merit. Uh, and, and before long, we were well on our way uh, towards implementing. Uh, my books were disqualified uh, for consideration because I was the originator uh, of the idea. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so to compensate for this deprivation they imposed on me, I was made uh, founding father of the project and given a special assignment, which I shall always remember, that we had chosen as one of the books which won and Nelson Mandela's Long Walk to Freedom, uh, which he had written in prison. Uh, and the project said, okay, Founding Father, this is your reward. You are going to present the award to Nelson Mandela in Cape Town at the ceremony. Now, if, if I'd received an award from
from Nelson Mandela. <laughs> uh, that would have been a great honor enough that to, but to be giving an award to Nelson Mandela <laughs> was really one of the highlights of my life, you see. So, uh, so we did have a spectacular event in Cape Town and awarded this and uh, I did have an opportunity uh, to uh, do that to Mandela. But, uh, but although I was having my idea of a hundred great books, had taken off so spectacularly, I was still disappointed by inadequate attention to literature written in African languages. So there's still a, uh, a heavy bias uh, in recognizing literature uh, in European languages. Uh, uh, and even in the case of uh, 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 Wally Schenker's Nobel Prize, uh, I haven't double checked, but he's almost the only Nobel Prize literary winner who's won it uh, for literature in a language other than his or her own. Most other literary uh, Nobel laureates get rewarded for things they had written uh, in their own language. And even Nagib Mahfouz in Egypt uh, got his uh, for uh, works in Arabic, but. Uh, with uh, Wale Shoinka, although he's very sensitive to African culture, uh, he was pretty clearly being awarded uh, for contributions to literature in the English language. So we are hoping that at least on that uh, domain uh, there will be some change. Uh, uh, I will clarify more fully with your further question uh, with regard to the canon itself. Okay. Modern African literature has gained international recognition with classics, with the class, I'm sorry. Modern African literature has gained international recognition with the classics of Chinwe Achebe, Nguji Watiyonga, and the Nobel Prize winner, Wole Sayinka. Who are today's prominent African writers? Also, how have African women asserted themselves into the African literary scene? Well, uh, it's true. One of the disadvantages of my particular generation, and uh, my particular generation does include people like Tinwa Achebe and Wale Shoinka, is that we came at a time when there was spectacular interest in what uh, independent Africa or was doing or was about to do, because we came at the great divide between the, the literature of the colonial era and the beginning of the post-colonial era. So the publishers were scrambling all over the place, you know, wanting to publish our works. Uh, and we had more opportunities than future generations of writers. So uh, many of the younger writers uh, uh, in the field uh, ha have had a mu much greater difficulty because of the decline of the novelty of African creativity. Uh, and the competition has been much greater than it mm -hmm. was before. Uh, now, it is true that there are uh, at attempts at moving literature in new fields uh, but the literary people who write, they are becoming increasingly in the diaspora, in the diaspora. Uh, uh, so Africans are dis seeking uh, other opportunities in the Western world and writing from the, from the Western world. So people like uh, Isidro Okwe, who, who my colleague, uh, combines uh, efforts at uh, interpreting uh, the ballad in the experience of uh, Africa, and at the same time attempts novels which are infused with fantasy so that there's less realism. Uh, uh, with regard to w women writers, uh, well, uh, there has been progress. There has been progress with regard to women writers, uh, including uh, uh, um, my colleague at Syracuse, Michelle Mugo, uh, who pushes uh, the frontiers of innovation 
uh, in the literary field. Uh, but there's still a lot more to be done to encourage uh, women writers. The, uh, the field of indigenous literature, uh, women uh, stand out more spectacularly. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there is uh, publishing taking place uh, in a number of different languages, including my own, my own mother tongue is Kiswahili or Swahili. Uh, and there's been a lot of uh, writing in Kiswahili in Tanzania and in Kenya uh, uh, in recent years, uh, including experimentation. Uh, so all those are, are pluses. So uh, women like uh, Grace Ogot, uh, starting earlier from a tradition linked with uh, uh, indigenous uh, narration and storytelling uh, started a process in Eastern Africa which has been followed by other writers since then. Okay. Thank you. Again, if we refer to your earlier wor article on the state of African literature since the 1930s, mm -hmm. in that article you identified seven conflict themes particularly the clash between Africa's past and present, between the individual and society, and between African identity and humanity. Do these themes continue, and are there new themes explored in current African literature? Those uh, seven conflicts I wrote about uh, uh, more than a decade ago, um, also one uh, uh, gratification in a, um, for a writer is that they are cited time and time again uh, as uh, the persistent dilemmas uh, of the writer, uh, the conflict between uh, uh, orientation towards uh, the individual and orientation towards society and uh, the conflict between uh, loyalty to society and loyalty to the human race. Uh, and many of these aspects uh, ha have continued as part of the reality of choice that we have to do. Uh, there, there are things that uh, have been inadequately addressed uh, by African writers uh, for a continent that suffers from many conflicts, uh, it's very sad that there is inadequate poetry of war uh, uh, in a continent of war. So there's a lot of uh, conflicts of different kinds within our continent, unfortunately. Uh, in most other circumstances, this would trigger uh, lamentations, examinations, uh, uh, pathos, tragedies, etc., etc., because uh, almost every country has a neighbor that has suffered, uh, uh, and I have noticed there has been very little. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have brought lines from a, a, a writer uh, who was ha himself killed by war, uh, and I suspect had he lived uh, long enough, uh, he would have become an anti-war poet. Yeah? And, uh, and that precisely uh, Christopher Okibo, uh, about whom I wrote a novel. So I, I, I wrote something at the conference in, at Harvard a few years ago in honor of the memory of Christopher Okibo. Uh, but this lamentation I had at Harvard uh, is still there, that the, the, this is a continent of war which has not yet produced poets of war, you see, poets of war, that, uh, and uh, you don't have to celebrate war, you can lament war, uh, but there has been very little. Now, I have lines here from Christopher Okibo, uh, and as I say, he became a victim, uh, uh, and, and strangely enough, there are lines which sound as if uh, they come from a someone who ought not to have joined the Biafra war. So it's almost as if it's ironic he joined uh, the Biafra war and he died. But, but his muse seemed to be aware 
of uh, the costs of war. Uh, so with your permission, can yes. I, may I read this? Yeah. Uh, death lay in ambush that evening in that island. Voice sought its echo that evening in that island. And the eye lost its light, and light lost its shadow. For the wind, eternal suitor of dead leaves, unrolled his bandages to the finest trimmer. It was an evening without flesh or skeleton, an evening with no silver bells to its tail, without lanterns, an evening without buntings, and it was an evening without age or memory. For we are talking of such commonplaces and on the brink of such great events. And in the freezing tuberoses of the white chamber, eyes that had lost their animal color, havoc of eyes of a candescent rays, pinned me cold to the marble stretcher until my eyes lost their blood and the blood lost its color. And the everlasting fire from the oblong window forgot the taste of ash in the air's marrow. Anguish and solitude smothered my scattered cry. And then uh, a, a standard that's probably one of the most beautiful written in uh, post-colonial Africa, Baokibo, uh, when you have finished and done up my stitches, wake me near the altar and this poem will be finished. <laughs> so it, is, it, 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 it sounds very much of uh, someone concerned by the cost of war, uh, and yet he didn't have to fight. He's almost the only major intellectual uh, that joined the war as a soldier uh, and then died very fast uh, after that. And uh, I, will, I personally although he wasn't someone I knew all that well, I was a very great admirer of his, uh, uh, I was moved so deeply and I related his death to the entire Nigerian tragedy from 1967 to 1970. Uh, and then in my quest to put the tragedy to rest in my psyche, as you, some of you may know who have read the trial of Christopher Okibo, which I had intended to be a therapy for my own anguish, <laughs> yeah, which, uh, which I wrote at that time. Uh, so I still lament, and I hope uh, <coughs> points uh, will rise to the occasion that we are a continent of war without poets of war, and we need to fill that gap. Thank you, sir. We've noted earlier that um, Many of Africa's writers are now living um, in the West, and they're writing in the West. Mm -hmm. And the content and style of their works are geared to Western audiences. In this contemporary context, is the direction of African literature changing? Are African writers living in North America and Europe writing from the continent different from the social reality portrayed? That's a very important question, but it's true that the people like me, that the African writers who are, who are now abroad um, and continue to write, what audiences do they have in mind? You see, this is part of the, of the canon we, we were discussing earlier, uh, is about what makes a work African. Yeah. Yes. So is, is it the, is it the, the, the content, is it the substance, what it is about? Uh, well, uh, that's not enough, you see. After all, we don't assume that Hamlet, uh, the pr Prince of Denmark, is part of Danish literature. Yeah? So the fact that the, <laughs> the, the work itself is uh, oriented uh, towards uh, a De Denmark-based story doesn't transform Hamlet into uh, a Danish contribution to world civilization. 
So it's not enough that it's about Africa uh, to make a country a, a novel or a poem African. Second type of measurements we have grappled with in the debate is what if it, but isn't the Africanness of the writer enough to make that work uh, African? Uh, and that I have a, a big debate with because sometimes the work may not be about Africa, but the person is African, uh, and, and uh, I have uh, uh, my my father has possible illustrations. So uh, he wrote about Islam. He wrote about Islam extensively, uh, both in Kiswahili and in the Arabic language. Uh, uh, and the fact that he wrote in Kiswahili Africanized his, his style, but in reality he was not discussing the African condition. He was interpreting uh, the Islamic religion, which is uh, bigger than, uh, than Africa uh, by the time he was there. Uh, so, so it's not enough either that the, the person writing is an African. Uh, my third condition, what makes a work African is the targeted audience. You know? uh, if the targeted audience is African, uh, uh, then the author is consciously sensitized to that issue uh, and seeks to be understood in terms of the impact of that work uh, upon Africans. Uh, and, uh, and we the, who live in the West are uh, now in a major dilemma because very often uh, the, the audiences we immediately have in mind uh, may be Africans, but many of them Africans in the diaspora. Mm -hmm. uh, and that may not be enough. Uh, the fourth area of defining what makes an work, work an African would give advantage to those who don't write in, in European languages, like my old man. So my old man uh, was not uh, now, so if you're writing in an indigenous language, uh, you, it's impossible for you if you are an African and you are writing in, uh, uh, in let's say, Somali, not to be constantly conscious of the Somali people. And, uh, and Nuruddin Farah, uh, the so Somalia's most distinguished. Uh, novelist in the English language uh, had that dilemma. He says, if I wrote in the Somali language, I would be conscious I'm addressing the Somali people. Uh, but he confessed that uh, the Som Somalia was under a dictator. Uh, so in fact, he, he wouldn't be read at all. So if, if he wrote in the Somali language at that time, uh, when Somalia as a whole was under a dictator, he argued, uh, that he wouldn't be read at all because his books would be banned uh, in precisely the countries where there were Somali readers. Uh, and so he, sta he started writing uh, both uh, novels and plays uh, uh, in the English language. And one of his plays uh, uh, I took part in. And so um, I don't know what role they gave me, but it <laughs> we <laughs> but we. Uh, we produced it in Jos, Nigeria. Uh, we produced it in Jos, Nigeria. It's called Yusuf and his brothers. Yusuf and his brothers. Uh, and it, uh, like so many of the works of Nuruddin Farah, has very conscious of uh, the consequences of tyranny, consequences of tyranny uh, in the human condition. So that illustrated this dilemma you were referring to. So many very when you are writing in English and you are based in the United States, or you're writing in French and you are based in France or Belgium, mm -hmm. uh, which audience are you conscious of? Uh, uh, and I, I, when I flatter myself, I say, look, I interpret Africa for Africans, and I'm trying to interpret Africa for the world. <laughs> yeah? mm -hmm. uh, now, in reality, uh, most Africans know about me much more through my television series uh, than they know about me through my books. Mm -hmm. if, uh, though in, uh, uh, <coughs> in fairness, they may know uh, some titles of the books I have written without the books being available uh, in their bookstores. Many of them are too expensive 
uh, because they were published in the West. So we have this constant dilemma as Africans. I don't think it's bad that uh, some of us should be interpreting Africa for the world rather than interpreting Africa for fellow Africans. Uh, but the best of all worlds would be one where you reach the African audience uh, 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 intimately. And right now, if you live in the West and write in a European language, uh, you, uh, you have less success right. in, reaching, in reaching Africans. Okay. Professor, my concluding question. Does or what role does African literature have in the world arena of literature? Is there a social and cultural message that African literature can bring to American and European audiences and to humanity in general? Yes, many of the, of the uh, writers of Africa, uh, including those who are pure, just purely writing poetry or, or writing fiction, uh, very often are simultaneously activists. Uh, they are people concerned with the human condition and not simply interpreting uh, other people's novels and being uh, literary critics. Uh, so people like uh, uh, Ngugi Wa Thiongo, uh, the no novelist from Kenya, uh, and uh, Chinua Achebe and Wale Shinkaya, they are actively political activists. They write essays that are engaged in dealing with the human condition more generally. Uh, and sometimes uh, they even get uh, uh, into trouble as a result. So, so in the case of Wale Shinka, I'm pr proud of one thing. I brought him to Binghamton, New York, uh, simultaneously with General Gawan, General uh, Yakubu Gawan, who was head of state at the time Wale Shoyinka was being mischievous about the Biafran war. He, uh, he was very sympathetic to the condition of the Igbo and hijacked the uh, uh, radio station, etc. And uh, the government of Yakubu Gawan put him in jail. Yeah put him in jail. And, and many years later, Wale Shoyinka and I had clashes uh, on precisely issues of the wider human condition. We quarreled and then I had a conference on uh, is globalization a dialogue between civilizations? Uh, and I said, okay, I'll invite Wale Shoyinka. Uh, see whether he'll come after my quarrel with him. Uh, and lo and behold, he said yes, uh, and I, I didn't offer him any honorarium. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I only offered expenses. Uh, he's a because he's a Nobel laureate uh, and a distinguished uh, uh, playwright. Uh, he was in great demand, but that one, that invitation, he decided it's time to bury the hatchet uh, between himself and myself. And he came. He didn't know I had with, with me at the same conference uh, a former head of state of Nigeria who had locked him up uh, <laughs> a few decades before. <laughs> uh, uh, and, uh, and then we, we had great fun uh, trivializing in a, in a, a constructive way uh, the fact that one of them had jailed the other. Uh, and that in the end, uh, we must now uh, bury the hatchet uh, and start afresh. And it was a quite successful uh, event. But above all, there was uh, this notion that these are people who have participated in historical events, uh, who have been witnesses to history, uh, uh, and who are very concerned about what goes on in the wider world. The heavenly has yet done what I want, that is produce more poets of war uh, in a continent that needs uh, talent in that direction. But they have done other methods uh, of containing human suffering, protesting human mischief, 
uh, and allowing the possibility of human reconciliation. Thank you. Professor Missouri, um, this concludes my questions. Um, again, I would like to thank you for granting me this interview, for granting us this interview here at the Library of Congress. And we thank you for helping us to launch our new series, Conversations with African Poets and Writers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bless you all and uh, best wishes to this project, which is worthy of your support. But we have section two, yeah? We said, yeah, section two. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. At this point, we will open the floor to questions. Uh, and I'd like to mention that we are webcasting this program. Um, when you ask a question, you are granting permission um, to be webcast. I'd like to ask also that we keep the questions very brief. As we mentioned, the professor does have another engagement. So please keep your questions brief. Um, this, this is a subject matter that is of great interest to myself as well as you can imagine, yeah? Uh, and there are people who, uh, who are writing today that are more Pan-African now than they were before. <laughs> so uh, so it, it's good that the, the flow in the literary field is towards greater consciousness of Pan-African identity uh, and greater interest in the production of literature in the diaspora uh, and the African uh, professors who teach courses that combine uh, literature from the continent with literature uh, from people of African ancestry. Uh, uh, the, there is some greater consciousness among politicians, uh, not enough among politicians, uh, but uh, uh, one of the tragedies of the uh, Libyan war is that uh, Gaddafi was the only Arab leader who decided he was an African first and an Arab second. Of all the Arabs of North Africa, he is the only one who, uh, he, he not only said it, he, he acted it, uh, that he was an Af African first and Arab second. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, uh, he made a mess of his relationship with the Arab world and he paid heavily because the Arabs threw him under the bus. The people who tried to end the civil war in uh, Libya by sending a particular delegation to solve it were people from the African Union. Yeah. The other Africans of the continent were the only ones who went there trying to end the conflict. But uh, the opposition was not interested because they had the backing of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Uh, uh, so so the, the fact that Gaddafi uh, made a mess of his Libyan policy should not m make us forget that he was more positive in his Pan-Africanism. Uh, his Pan-Africanism. I spent many hours with him uh, uh, when he was in power, uh, uh, and I was on record as saying he was a good African, but a bad, a bad Libyan, uh, etc. Uh, but and and he invested in different African countries, uh, uh, but in general, uh, he wasn't the only one among the leaders of the continent as a whole who are becoming more sensitive to Pan Africanism. Okay, we'll take one more. Question here. Um, I wanted to ask a question. It's kind of maybe it's too far, but um, I recently read uh, Africanism by Joan Hazard, and she uses hybrid language infusing her book with Igbo as well as English. Is that a good vehicle for African writers to be able to stay connected 
to their African audience as well as open up to an American audience or an English speaking audience. And my second part was I wanted you to make a comment about your fellow country person who recently passed away and was also writing on that. Yes. Uh, well, uh, it's true, infusing uh, uh, a work in pre European language, in English, uh, with, uh, let's say, proverbs, wisdom uh, from African languages and reproduced in African languages. Chino uh, Achebe did a bit of that, Awaro Shenita did a bit of that, but we need to do more of that, uh, to do that. And much of that will also affect what audiences will respond uh, uh, to the style of writing. Uh, now it's true that uh, whole new languages are emerging that are mixed. There should be greater creativity in Pidgin English in Nigeria. Yeah? It's, a, it's a language in its own right. It's very widely spread. Uh, 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 it may not be regarded as respectable, but we should regard it as potentially creative. Uh, uh, and there is a pidgin English in Ghana, and there is in Kenya what is called Swahinglish, uh, <laughs> a combination of Swahili with the English language. Uh, uh, so the trend is there, but not yet fully mature. Uh, with regard to Wangari Masai, uh, yes, it was a very sad loss, and, uh, and I forgot uh, she was, uh, she was already in her 70s uh, because she always looked uh, 50, young, <laughs> 50 years younger than me. <laughs> yeah. uh, very sad, and I must conclude uh, on this issue with Mangari Masai that she helped to change the criteria of peace. Uh, you know, peace is more than just saving human lives, it's also saving planet Earth. It's very important to face human lives. Uh, most of the Nobel Prizes were concerned with race relations. That's important. But there was a tendency to overlook that there are other forms of dangers, including the dangers to planet Earth. And she, on her own, helped to move uh, the Nobel system for peace, which is based in uh, Oslo rather than Stockholm, uh, she moved it towards regarding defending planet Earth relevant for peace. Uh, and I was truly delighted uh, that their conception of peace had widened uh, to the extent of rewarding those who are trying their, trying their best uh, to save the habitats of the human species. So we shall always remember her for that contribution. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, we have to conclude our program at this time. Uh, I'd like to invite all of you to please visit the African and Middle Eastern Division website for the Conversation in African Poets and Writers series. We are currently scheduling future writers to join us. Um, so if you visit our website, you will see some of the writers that we will be featuring or interviewing here at the library. We thank all of you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.